Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the content packs. What's the date? I'm not entirely sure. It's only one day and I'm already bloody exhausted. And I've got another five or so hours because the co-optional podcast panel is tonight. We are the last panel of the night, which means that we are likely to go all night. Well, we'll see how that one turns out. So let me tell you what we've been up to at PAX and what's been going on. So PAX this time around is the biggest, I think, that I've ever seen it. PAX East was pretty big this year. I've been to a Prime before in Seattle, of course, same venue. This time it's four days, and it's even more intense in terms of what they've got here. They just have... The two main exhibition halls, but they've got a lot of side exhibition halls, which are even bigger than they used to be. The last time we went, the small exhibition halls on like the sixth floor were maybe only half used. This time around, way, way more, which is actually kind of insane to look at. Very, very busy on Friday already. We'll see how it turns out on Monday. Maybe Monday will be a quieter day. It will give us a lot of opportunity to get some more coverage, which is nice. So we're starting to book up stuff for Monday. All right, let, let me talk about what I've been doing and the kind of coverage we've been doing. The... People that have been following me on Twitter will be aware that I did put out a little pastebin document that told you about the five kinds of coverage that we're doing here. We are doing interviews, obviously. You know, we, we focused less on that last time around, but honestly, looking at the numbers from things like E3, interviews when conducted properly about interesting titles are very popular and informative pieces of content, so we will be doing that. We are also doing now hands-on stuff where we don't get direct feed, which is kind of a new thing. We always up to this point have said, look, we want to get direct feed. And if we're not getting direct feed, there's nothing we can show, then there's no point. But based on the survey that we took from the PAX vlog from PAX East, we have determined that you guys are okay with us not getting direct feed. You're okay with B-Real. What you want is my opinion, and what you want is my opinion on Fettered, which means that you don't want the dev kind of right behind me and stopping me from saying negative things, things like that. You want that gone. So for the most part, the dual dev commentary is gone. There are a couple of exceptions, stuff like the Natural Selection 2 expansion pack, which we played today with Hugh, who is a phenomenal co-commentator, as you are well aware. The three pieces of NS content that we did for you guys, you really liked, so we've done another one. And it was a pretty good one too, so hopefully you'll enjoy that one. So we're doing that, and we're also doing direct feed stuff which doesn't involve the dev. We've actually got quite a few pieces of that where I will do the commentary later on. So basically you're getting either Alpha Strike or WTF is direct from the show, but you're getting it in an environment that isn't noisy and without the dev there. So it's like best of both worlds. You get better quality, and you don't have the developer kind of sitting over the shoulder. You know, it's a little bit disappointing not to be able to bring the developer perspective, because I think it's very interesting, but I feel that the feedback was valid in saying that a lot of these particular things very much had a problem of being more of a sales pitch than anything else. So the dev was there to try and sell their game, as it were. And as a direct result... We had problems of people just saying, look, I'm not interested in watching a dev make a sales pitch. I'm really not. This is not my thing. Okay, cool. We listened. So we've hopefully changed that around, and I'm hoping that you guys will really like it. It does mean we'll also be able to get content out a little bit faster, and then there's other content which will take a little bit longer. Uh, all of the post-commentated stuff is going to take much longer than it otherwise did. So it does mean higher quality content, but it does mean that content might be a little bit slower, which is fine because there's so much of it that there's no point in us dumping out 10 videos a day because I know you won't watch it. All right, what did we see on the PAX show floor today? First thing I actually saw was Battlefield 4. That, that's just available to play right there. I, they are running on PCs. I actually asked them this, and we even looked inside. It was clearly a fairly high-end PC running it. It was the PC build, and the guys at the booth very specifically said, yeah, this game is like optimized with PC in mind, which was actually a very cool thing to hear. Obviously, the PC build of Battlefield 3 was by far the most superior as well. BF4 is kind of the same. Performance-wise, they clearly aren't there yet. I definitely saw drops below 60. I didn't really see it go to 30. Like my, Based on what I'm noticing, bear in mind, I didn't have a frame rate counter running, so um, I have to guess. Most of the game was running at 60. There were some drops down to about 40 in some areas. The view distance in that game is very, very long, and there's a lot of more vertical gameplay versus what you saw in previous Battlefield titles. So the map we were playing was the same one that you've probably seen when you watch the demos at the, the various press events. So, yeah, it was an interesting experience. They also had Xbox One controllers plugged in as the primary method of controlling, which was very weird. I couldn't actually figure out how to get into a vehicle because it said press E, and it's like, there's no E here. I don't know what's happening. But I'll tell you more about Battlefield 4 when I do my... I'll do a little impressions video of it. I want to try and get a little bit more hands-on time. What I can tell you about is the controller. You know, the Xbox One controller, which I, that's my first time actually messing around with it. 
it's not bad. Uh, it's it's pretty solid. The D-pad is really, really good this time around. It's way better than it used to be. Triggers are nice and responsive. It's a nice shape, and obviously the aesthetic design is very positive. I like the face buttons. They are very responsive, and they're well ergonomic. But the one problem I do have with it is actually the thumbsticks. You may have noticed on the renderings of it, the thumbsticks kind of have grips around the side. They actually left an imprint in my thumb, like after about 10 minutes of play, which is quite surprising. They are pretty harsh. So I have a feeling that if, if you're the kind of person that sort of moves their thumb around a lot on the stick and doesn't just keep it in one position, you're actually maybe going to get some kind of friction burn. It's going to wear your skin a bit. So it may be that there will be post-release some kind of thing that you can put on top of it to get rid of that. The PS4 controller, which I also tried today, didn't have that problem. The PS4 controller actually feels great. Obviously, it's very classic design. They haven't really changed an awful lot there. I do like it. It felt really good. I think the triggers are perhaps not as good as the Xbox Ones, but I feel the thumbsticks are better, and I actually got a tighter control from them than I've experienced in other games. So that was pretty good. You'd be surprised how many PC games are actually running PS4 controllers as their primary method, which is quite promising. It looks like they're all plugged in via USB. There was some stuff running in a PS4 dev environment. Some stuff wasn't, but it was all running on PCs because a lot of these games are coming to PS4 quite early because of Sony's push with the indie scene. So a couple of the games that I played today had that, including a game called Tiny Brains, which was an entertaining cooperative romp, let's just say. Everyone plays a different super-powered lab animal, which is being taken through a series of cooperative puzzles that you have to work together in order to solve. And there are, there are some co-optional elements in there as well. It is entirely possible to kill the other people and it is hilarious to do so interesting sense of humor i think there might be a, maybe a little bit more of an in-depth message in that game even though it's kind of comedic and we actually had a good time just sitting down on the couch with ps4 controllers playing that, that and that was actually a pc game but it is of course coming out to ps4 as well so that was entertaining i i had a good amount of fun with that it's it's not too taxing on the brain but i know there's some stuff which will require an awful lot of communication and coordination there's not an awful lot of co-op puzzlers that require that kind of direct input so i think that will interest a lot of people people what else did i do i have had a look at a game called contrast contrast might be my game of the show so far obviously i've got three more days to go but contrast is really special uh, it is a very very cool game it's set in a sort of film noir style it's a mashup between 20s burlesque and 40s film noir it's got a great soundtrack to it and it's about the imaginary friend of this girl who is uh, has a, a tough kind of family relationship her mother's a burlesque dancer her father that's like a con man and you are the imaginary friend of this girl who can transition in between being a fully 3d character and also being a 2d character on walls that could walk on shadows so there's a lot of light manipulation in that game kind of similar to closure but instead of avoiding the negative space because it kills you as in if you can't see it it doesn't exist it's actually a case of the negative space is used as a platforming mechanic and the switching between the 3d and 2d elements are required but there's a lot of style in that game it's very impressive it's actually been developed by a couple of x arcane guys the guys that made dishonored it's a very high fidelity really interesting experience so i will show you more of that in the coming days i've got a lot of footage of it including stuff that hasn't been seen before what else do we look at? We had a look at Telepath Tactics, which was an interesting little nod back to all the Fire Emblem and Shining Force games. It plays very much like a mashup of Final Fantasy Tactics, Tactics Ogre, as well as stuff like Shining Force and, of course, Fire Emblem. It's got a very basic graphic style. It very much is reminiscent of the older NES titles, although a little bit tighter on the art design there. And it, what interested me about it was a very limited resource management kind of system, which was based around very limited mana pools which could be regenerated by resting your character which means that you can't just spam spells you can use maybe one or two you can maybe use one of the most powerful or two of the two of the others and then you're done like that's it so you got very powerful abilities but you've got to consider that there's also a nice backstab mechanic which means positioning is very important so graphically very basic but a very tight tactics based system and also it does include local multiplayer so you can actually play i think up to four players which is pretty awesome and actually have tactical randomized battles and things like that Play Defense Grid 2. Pretty damn cool. Got some interesting ideas behind it. That was that was really, really nice. And also, there's another game that I want to show you by them, which is essentially next-level Minecraft. It's actually really special. It uses the Minecraft block-building mechanics, 
but it uses a, kind of a voxel-based engine as well to create worlds that don't look blocky, yeah? So it, you can meld the blocky building elements in with the, the actual world that looks more realistic, and you can also use a tool to kind of smooth out your creation. So it's not just a bunch of blocks. There's also an AI race within the game that you're kind of trying to help build up to a level of civilization. And the AI is really quite impressive. It did some rather interesting and unexpected stuff even in the alpha form. A lot of the building stuff is really great, but also they've taken away stuff like tools so you can do anything. You can just dig, but you can also get enhancements which allow you to dig faster or further or do other things. So that's going to be really interesting. I'll show you alpha footage of that. I think you're going to be quite excited by how that looks. What else did we see? I looked at World of Warplanes in its current state. Actually, I haven't had the chance to do that. It was surprisingly fun. I played with some of the higher tier stuff, including the Messerschmitt. Oh, there was the 262 Jet, which I did reasonably well with, although that thing is about as maneuverable as a block of steel on a ski. So that really wasn't that ideal. But I was able to fly around and have a pretty good time, even with the keyboard and mouse. So, yeah, I mean, that's looking solid. It's, it's World of Warplanes. It's to be expected that it's going to be another solid kind of wargaming title. As much as I would have liked to tell you about the, what they're doing with Master of Orion or Total Annihilation, we currently don't know anything yet. We don't have any access to that. What else do we see? All right, we saw so much, and I'm going to forget some stuff and feel really bad. I did play Chivalry Deadliest Warrior. Yes, indeed. I did a lot of stabby stabby. My dueling skills were clearly coming into play there. Samurai versus Spartans. Pretty good build so far. It's very much in alpha. There's a lot to come. They've got a lot of custom animations that I think you're going to enjoy, and a lot of sort of combinations of fighting styles which are not available in stuff like chivalry medieval warfare the idea that if you draw a katana that's actually an attack because as you draw it there's kind of a flourish you can actually kill people that way also the spartan uses the shield as part of his attack which is something that you don't really do that much in you, you can do kind of a shield bash but it's part of the combo the spear and shield combo looks different to using a spear or some kind of pole arm weapon within chivalry medieval warfare and they're doing that for each of the types i did hear the the knight is going to be the third class, so that'll be from chivalry, and then there's going to be two more, so we don't know what they are, one assumes the IRA is not one of them, but one way or the other, we did play that, and that was actually a really good time, That that's playing, it's playing solid, you know, it plays like chivalry, it's a bit faster than chivalry actually, which I think is going to be interesting to some people, and there's some interesting asymmetric elements, like the Spartan has no ranged weapons, aside from the fact that he can throw his spear, but if he throws the spear, he loses the spear, so the samurai can actually just grab a bow as a secondary, but you'd be surprised at actually how vulnerable that can make you, that sounds OP, but it's actually not, so there's some interesting things going on there. Played Natural Selection 2. Obviously, this is with the updates. It plays so much better now. It is a phenomenal game. It really, really is. So you need to go play it on free weekend. It's free all weekend, and it's 75% off. Please go and play NS2. It's so good. I, a lot of the stuff that was a problem at launch, like performance issues, like lack of tutorial, that's been resolved. I played some of their new expansion, which is completely free, by the way. It's called Reinforcement. So there's loads of stuff. They've actually got like a brand new uh, map pack and brand new set, tile set, so everything looks different. It's come along so much. It's one of the most unique FPS on PC. Please do go check it out. And we also look at Wildstar again. Uh, we're going to be looking again at it. I think on Monday we saw some theater presentations, including dungeon play and raids. So we got to ask a lot of questions there. So I can tell you quite a lot about it. But we're also going to be looking at some of the higher end stuff, which might include a bit of world PvP. So that we're going to be looking at that on Monday. So I can answer a few questions about that. We should be getting access to some dungeon feed, which will allow me to give you some commentary and actually relay some of that information that I got from the devs, as well as some of the QA that I did with them. So we had an interesting discussion about things like business models and also raid progression and how you basically start off, you know, get it to level 50 and then how you progress from that to actually doing the full 40 mans. So there's a lot of interesting information there. That pretty much wraps up PAX Day 1. I've probably forgotten a couple of games because it's actually been insane. We've been doing so much stuff. So much stuff. Oh, yeah, I forgot Dying Light. God, how can I forget Dying Light? That was... That's a new Techland game. It's another Techland zombie game, but this time around, they've actually gone for more focus on survival and parkour, and it's in first person. I, I have not played a first person game with this kind of parkour. Mirror's Edge parkour does not compare. Yeah, a Mirror's Edge parkour is good, this is like if you took the Assassin's Creed kind of free-running style whereby holding down the button lets you adapt very much to your terrain, but put it in first person, you'd have that. It eliminates every problem that I've ever had with first-person platforming. It's like Brink system, but better. 
and it's really you in integrate that with zombie survival and the use of traps and essentially trying to escape like you can't really fight like you could in dead island you can do a lot of damage you've got some interesting weapons and they're very very fun to use but you can be very easily mobbed whereas you don't really you don't really have the toughness that you would have in dead island so it's less of an arcade game more of a survival game it's fully open world it looks really exciting and i played a bunch of it and i'll give you my hands-on impressions but like based on what i saw it's actually could be really really cool and there's probably other things that I've forgotten because that's the way. But we've been so busy today at PAX. I actually ran into Adam Sessler, if you can believe that. That was pretty cool. We we had a few words. We're going to be talking a little bit later on. So it'll be interesting to be able to pick his brain on a number of different things. Ran into all sorts of different people. Saw all sorts of crazy things. For those of you asking about games like Titanfall, asking about what Watch Dogs and things like that, we were told today that Assassin's Creed 4 Watch Dogs currently not playable on the show floor. There may be some way that we can get access in another way. We will look for that. Titanfall is playable on Xbox One. The lines for it are insane and there are no press appointments. So as far as we know, they're not showing that back behind closed doors or anything like that. So we would have to queue up for about three hours to get an impression of Titanfall. That's not really worth the time. We can do like six other games in that time. So that's a bit of a disservice. I don't think we should do that. But if we can get access to Titanfall, I, I will look that. That was actually a last minute addition to the show roster. We didn't know Titanfall was going to be there. So that's the thing. There's a lot of Xbox One here. There's a lot of PlayStation 4 here. We'll be for the most part avoiding that. But there are these kind of weird situations where there's these indie games which are coming out first on PS4, but they're also PC games. So we will be covering that. That's stuff like Contrast and Tiny Brains and so on and so forth. So that's PAX Day 1, folks. I will be doing the GameStation podcast panel and that will be interesting. It's called the Game Station Podcast Panel on the schedule. So, I'll I'll tr I'll probably yeah, I've got this idea about starting the co-optional and then just like cutting it off and saying this is the Game Station Podcast, blah blah blah. But I think all the Polaris people are going to be there, so maybe I'll get fired. Huh. We'll see how that goes. It could be interesting. Oh man, yeah, so much to cover. Obviously, I'll try and keep you up to date on what's been going on over the next few days. I know a lot of people have been asking, can you give me my thoughts on the 2DS? I'm going to talk about that on the panel. We're going to talk about the 2DS on the panel, so we'll do that, and I'll give you more thoughts on Xbox One versus PlayStation 4 controllers and things like that. Should be fun. Yeah, PAX is exhausting already. Yeah, we are really, really tired already, and th th today's going to be crazy. We've still got the panel to do, and that's going to be unbelievably crazy. So, if you don't mind, I'm going to try and rest for an hour, and then I'm going to get my thoughts together, and then go and try and wrangle Jesse and Dodger for another couple of hours. Thank you very much for watching, folks. I'll bring you another content packs tomorrow at some point. I'll see you next time.